Hi, I just want to go ahead and get started so we have plenty of time uh, for our talk today. Uh, I am Dr. Daniel McFarlane. I'm the Director of Psycho-Oncology here at Wilmot Cancer Center, and I have the uh, distinct pleasure of introducing uh, one of my uh, mentors and friends uh, that I have known for quite a while now um, and hold in very high esteem, that's Dr. William Breitbart. And so Dr. Breitbart is the chairman of uh, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, he is also an attending psychiatrist on the Supportive Care Service Department of Medicine at MSK. And he is professor of clinical psychiatry and vice chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Breitbart graduated from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine at Yeshiva University. He's board certified in internal medicine, psychiatry, and psychosomatic medicine. He received clinical fellowships from the American Cancer Society and the Career Development Award. And very importantly, I believe, he was a Soros faculty scholar of the Open Society Institute Project on Death in America from 1995 to 98. This was a forum that really tried to tackle the issues of death and dying in the United States. And so Dr. Breitbart was a, a member who contributed vastly to that project. Um, he is also a founding member, member of the American Psychosocial Oncology Society, that is APOS, and the International Psycho-Oncology Society. He was president of the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine uh, in 2007 and also served as president of the International Psycho-Oncology Society. He is a member of the board of directors of the American Pain Society and a member of the International Association for the for the study of pain. He was a pan panel member of the American Psychiatric Association guidelines for the management of delirium in the HCPR cancer pain management guidelines and the NCCN guidelines panel for both distress and fatigue. Dr. Breitbart has ser served as a permanent member of the NIH behavioral medicine study section for 15 years also serving as Chief of Psychiatry Service at MSK from 1996 until 2017. Dr. Breitbart's research uh, efforts have focused on psychiatric aspects of cancer and palliative care and have included studies, uh, intervention studies on anxiety, depression, desire for hastened death, delirium in patients with cancer and AIDS. Other research efforts have included the investigation of several different neuropsychiatric symptoms in both cancer and AIDS patients, including pain, fatigue, and other symptoms. Dr. Breitbart has had continuous NIH R01 funding of investiga investigator-initiated research since 1989. It's quite an achievement. Dr. Breitbart has received numerous awards, and I will list them here. Uh, he has the research award from the uh, Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine, the Donald Oaken Award uh, from the um, Society for Liaison Psychiatry, the, uh, the pre prestigious Arthur Sutherland Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, the Willett Whitmore Award for Clinical Excellence from Memorial Sloan Kettering, the Thomas Hackett Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine, uh, Jimmy Holland Distinguished Leadership Award from the American Psychosocial Oncology Society, uh, the American Cancer Society Tish Green Quality of Life Research Award, and the, and the 2019 International Psycho-Oncology Society Jimmy Holland Award for Lifetime Contributions to Psychiatric Oncology, and I think most recently, 2023 Lifetime Achievement Award for Outstanding Contributions to Palliative Care from the MD Anderson Cancer Center. He has published extensively on psychiatric complications of cancer and AIDS. Uh, many, many peer-reviewed publications, over 200 chapters, review papers, editorials, all editions of the Psycho-Oncology textbook, several books concerning our topic of today, which is meaning-centered therapy, both in group and individual formats. He is the editor-in-chief of the journal Palliative and Supportive Care. Uh, Dr. Breitbart also helped found the IPOS Press, which is a publication arm of the International Society of Psycho-Oncology. Uh, so, Dr. Breitbart, so on a personal note, uh, it is, like I said, a very distinct, I have, now I'm going to look up Dr. Breitbart. So, um, I've known Dr. Breitbart for some time, 
And what I want to say is that uh, it really cannot be overstated, the contributions that he has made to this field. Um, and on a personal note, what it is like to round with Dr. Breitbart is quite an experience. Uh, you should know that he is one of the most lively, personable, and energetic people I've ever known, clearly, from all of his uh, awards and accolades. But more importantly, um, and I just want to say, we love you, Bill. We absolutely love you. Everyone who has gone through MSK's training, the reason why isn't because of all this on this page that I'm reading. It's because his presence, his way of being with patients, patients who are suffering. And I think really what Dr. Breitbart has contributed to the field, if you think about it, over a career that's now spanning several decades, is that sitting with patients who are suffering on, in, in terms of existential distress, anxiety, depression, delirium, is no easy task. And what we're gonna hear about today are ways in which, as a, as a therapist, as, a, as an intervention to sort of treat patients and, and have patients come away feeling better, something that we can, we can do. And, uh, in much more eloquent terms, Dr. Breitbart is going to go into all of that. Uh, I thank you very much, and I, I, I greatly look forward to his talk. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Hold on, Dan. I want to just make a comment. Uh, Dan, as you well know, uh, I've been introduced before at talks. I think I've been. I think I've had about. Uh, I've had introductions before uh, giving around. At this point, close to ten thousand talks over forty years. I and it. I, yeah, and I have to say, Dan, that this introduction that you just gave, this very heartfelt introduction that you just gave me, is by far the most recent introduction I've ever received. <laughs> so thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going to share my uh, slides. Let's see if this works. Oh my, it looks like it might work. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, it's the afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to talk about meaning-centered psychotherapy. And I have way too many slides, so I'm going to try to talk rapidly, but not too rapidly that um, people don't understand me and that I and that the interpreter doesn't fall behind uh, in terms of, uh, of following me. Uh, I just want to warn the interpreter that I once made an interpreter cry. and She had to pause in the middle of a talk, so be careful about that. I actually do have a few disclosures. Uh, all of the treatment manuals and the textbooks on um, meaning-centered psychotherapy uh, are published by Oxford University Press. And if you're like inspired by this talk today, you might actually go out and buy one of these things. So I might get like a dollar and 25 cents or something. And then also, uh, we've been working with a company, a digital therapeutic company called Digital uh, Blue Note Digital Therapeutics to adapt meaning sound psychotherapy for uh, as a digital uh, application that can be pres prescribed by uh, clinicians, by psychiatrists. So Rather than having to do it yourself, you can prescribe it. Your oncologist can prescribe it for a patient, and it saves a psych consult, although you may not want to save psych consults. You want to have as many as you, as you possibly can. So uh, this slide uh, sort of describes uh, the psychotherapy laboratory that I, uh, that I had. For the last uh, 15, 20 years, I've, been the, um, I've had a lot of titles at Memorial. But one of, one of my titles, we have about eight research labs at Memorial in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And um, uh, I've been direct, director of the psychotherapy lab. Uh, and that's the official name of the psychotherapy lab is the psychotherapy lab. The unofficial name of the psychotherapy lab is the Laboratory of Despair. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that all of the faculty members in my, uh, in my lab don't get funding and they're all like pulling their hair out and they're really upset and distressed. It has to do with the subject matters that we study. So initially we developed uh, and adapted existing psychotherapies for cancer patients that focused on uh, depression, anxiety, panic, DSM, 
uh, four or five um, uh, uh, psychiatric disorders. Now we would adapt IPT uh, for ca cancer patients and uh, treating depression, things like that. Uh, at some point, though, we moved from um, uh, developing interventions for DSM diagnostic disorders to addressing uh, a, um, a group of what I call uh, a, a group of uh, problems that fall into the bucket of a sort of existential distress or existential despair. Uh, these, I, I call them meta-diagnostic constructs, things like uh, desire for haste and death, hopelessness, loss of dignity, demoralization, loss of meaning and spiritual well-being. Now, when we talk about despair, there are sort of two two ways to understand the word despair. Despair comes from the Latin or French roots uh, de espoir, without hope. But espoir also means inspiration or spirit. So without spirit, without uh, anything that interferes with the essence of who you are as a, as a person, uh, anything that limits uh, you uh, being your authentic self, which causes suffering. Uh, according to Carl Jaspers, the definition of suffering is uh, any human being's encounter with limitations. Uh, so we started studying these various cons uh, those various existential constructs and um, uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the intervention that we developed around loss of meaning and loss of spiritual well-being, primarily loss of meaning. That work came out of studies that we had done uh, about, you know, uh, over the, the, the late 90s, early 2000s, around desire for haste and death in two populations, in AIDS patients and in cancer patients. And we studied what are the factors that lead a patient to want to have desire for haste and death out of out of a sense of despair we're not talking about somebody who uh, is accepting of their death and they, they they want they would rather you know you know they'd rather die in peace at their home and not and not prolong things we're talking about a kind of a despair that leads to desire for haste and death well the results of those studies initially showed that about 35, 40% of patients with high desire for haste and death. And we actually had to develop our own measures of desire for haste and death because there were no uh, validated uh, available measures of desire for haste and death. So we developed a measure called the Schedule of Attitudes Towards Haste and Death, SAD. And we validated it in both AIDS and cancer patients. And it's the standard for measuring desire for haste and death. And uh, so in looking at desire for haste and death, the first thing that popped up was undiagnosed, untreated depression, made up about 35 to 40 percent of patients who had high desire for haste and death. A small percentage of patients had uncontrolled pain. A small percentage of patients had lack of social support. Another small percentage of patients had very poor uh, uh, Karnofsky scores or, or uh, physical performance scores. About 35, 40 percent had clinical depression. We then set us set about to study. Uh, what happens to the desire for death in, hate, in patients with clinical depression, untreated depression? Uh, what happens to the desire for hate and death? So we did a couple of, we did two studies, one in AIDS and one in uh, cancer, advanced cancer patients, looking at uh, treating pharmacologically uh, patients with uh, um, both clinical trials um, uh, and, uh, and NIH-funded R1 uh, clinical trials. We, we looked at what happens when you treat desire, uh, depression in patients who have depression and have score high on a desire for haste and death scale. Turns out desire for haste and death remits. So, okay, great. We figured out that if most of the time you can treat depression in a patient who has desire for haste and death, they don't want a desire for haste and death. Patient in uncontrolled pain, treat pain, they often don't want desire for haste and death anymore. But we were left with about a 45% variance that we did not know, we did not understand what were the causes of high desire for death in that population. We then set out to do a, another group of studies, and what we found was that loss of meaning and loss of hope were both unique and uh, independent of clinical depression, were both unique and synergistic uh, factors that, that contributed to 
uh, explaining about 30, 35% more of the variance. There's a small group of about 10% of folks where we can't figure out that where there doesn't seem to be a quote unquote disorder or uh, something causing distress in patients who want desire for hasten that these might be the people who ask for medical assistance and dying and things like that. Uh, they they've lived their lives freely and they want to die, you know uh, they've made you know, they've chosen how they live and 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 uh, lived an authentic life and they want to die a free authentic life consistent with who they are and their principles, et cetera. Uh, we also then did a bunch of studies looking at what what are the effects of, of sustaining meaning on psychological distress outcomes. And what we found was that uh, using this uh, the facet spiritual well-being scale, which has a component of both of uh, meaning and a component of faith, what we found was that uh, if you were able to sustain a sense of meaning, and this was not true for the faith component of uh, spiritual, the facet spiritual well-being scale. If you were able to sustain a sense of meaning, that buffered against depression, anxiety, desire for haste and death, suicidal ideation, physical symptom burden, distress, and improved quality of life. So we thought that with that data, we we set us we we decided it would be helpful for patients who had this sense of despair and this loss of meaning uh, and, and, a, and as a resulting existential distress and despair, that an intervention to enhance or sustain uh, sustain or enhance uh, a sense of meaning would be helpful. I must tell you at the time, I looked through every page of the PDR looking for a drug that would uh, enhance meaning. I couldn't find one. Now, this is before all of the psilocybin studies that started to come out. Uh, in the last five years or so. And uh, I may have been tempted to try psilocybin, but at the time I developed mini sinus psychotherapy, there was no medication. I might've gone the easier medication route of uh, being a, uh, a, a, you know, a traditionally uh, uh, um, uh, American trained uh, uh, psychiatrist in a psychiatry residency in the United States who didn't get too much psychotherapy training, um, managed to get just enough. So we decided uh, to develop an intervention uh, focusing on how to um, in, uh, sustain or enhance a sense of meaning, and that was and that's uh, and that's that led to the development of uh, meaning centered psychotherapy, which basically utilized um, the ideas of uh, Viktor Frankl, who was a Viennese psychiatrist, came a little bit after Freud whose main contribution to psychiatry uh, was, the, was his uh, recognition that meaning and the, and the uh, experience of meaning, the pursuit of meaning, uh, was the primary motivating force of human behavior, was a third primary motivating uh, force of human behavior, and that there were, uh, that there were uh, several uh, easily accessible sources of meaning that could be utilized in terms of recreating, re-experiencing, and enhancing a sense of meaning. And so we took Frankl's basic principles of meaning, meaning uh, and and his, uh, his psychotherapy, which he developed, which is called logotherapy, which none of us are expert in at Memorial. Uh, that's a sort of a, a, an existential analytic kind of psychotherapy that's long-term, it's not structured, not specifically geared towards cancer patients. It's, um, it was met, it was developed for the Viennese uh, bourgeoisie who sat in cafes drinking coffee and schlagen going, is that all there is to life? You know, things like that. Uh, so we then set out to develop meaning-centered psychotherapy. And meaning-centered psychotherapy is very much an existential psychotherapy. Uh, now, you could read uh, Irv Yalom's textbook of existential psychotherapy. That would take you a few weeks. Uh, or you can read the chapter on existential psychotherapy in my textbook of meaning-centered psychotherapy, which I'll flash on as a slide later. Uh, uh, but um, it's helpful to have just some background in, in uh, what I call the ontology of oncology. Uh, some, some of the sort of the unique, the, the existential aspects of being human. 
uh, some of the common uh, concepts that are, that are not critical. You don't have to be an expert in existentialism, but it's helpful to be aware of. Uh, and and uh, this is a list of some of the major ones. Uh, about two, 300 years ago, Kierkegaard taught us that human beings were unique amongst all other animals and that we had the uh, ability to uh, become aware of our existence. Now, he may have been wrong. It may be that orangutans have this ability or whales or something like that, but it's been difficult for us to determine this. Uh, certainly when um, uh, my son's dog Cooper looks in the mirror, he barks at that uh, image. He doesn't recognize himself. Uh, but human beings are uniquely aware of our existence. And that usually happens. We were, we were able, we are able to objectively contemplate ourselves. And this happens usually around 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, right? Um, and so as a result of being aware of our existence, uh, Kierkegaard hypothesized that we're overcome with two emotions. One is the emotion of awe. Isn't being alive awesome? And the emotion of dread. Oh my God, we're mortal. We're finite. We die. And we can die at any moment. And the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning anthropologist Ernest Becker wrote a book called Denial of Death. Uh, the Denial of Death. And he hypothesized that all primitive cultures and even more modern, modern cultures, uh, which look very much like religions, and they pretty much are religions. Uh, basically, human beings develop cultures or quote-unquote religions uh, that help them uh, deal with uh, uh, the, the, the dread of death, the angst of death. They answer the questions, where did I come from? What am I supposed to be doing here? Where am I going? They either answer it literally or metaphorically. And in the beginning, there were uh, cultures and religions with hundreds of gods, and slowly over the centuries, we've we've withered it down to one god. And Christopher Hitchens might say we're getting very close to the right number, but I don't want to say that. Um, when when a uh, an interviewer asked uh, Carl Jung uh, this question, uh, uh, he. Uh, this interviewer was uh, was was uh, interviewing Carl Jung, and he asked Carl Jung, "When did you first realize that you existed?" And he didn't hesitate. He didn't even hesitate a second. He he just answered immediately. He said, "I was twelve years old." I'm sorry. He said, "I was eleven years old." Suddenly, I became aware. I was in a field, and suddenly, I became aware. I am, I exist. Before this, I was in a mist, undifferentiated, but suddenly I emerged from this mist and I exist, I am. So Carl Jung knew the exact moment. Um, now what happens besides be, uh, having these two unique uh, kind of uh, experiences or emotions of awe and dread, we're also overcome with a sense of existential obligation or what's called responsibility. What is my responsibility? What is my ability to respond to the fact that I exist? And the answer to that is that uh, your responsibility is to create is from existence to create a life, to create uh, a who in the world. Uh, or to create what the existentialists call you call your essence. Now, a religion, and they are often talk about existence precedes essence. A religious person would say that God gives you an essence, and then you come into existence. Um, these were not religious uh, thinkers. These a lot of these existentialists. So your obligation is to create a life, and this life. Uh, the life that you create and the who that you create has to be unique. Oscar Wilde said, live your life. Everyone else's life is taken. It's a life in which you need to live to its full potential, a life in which, of meaning, a life of, of direction and intention and transformation and growth, becoming a useful member of a community and a society in the world, right? I'm, uh, and, and living a, a, a life of meaning. Um. And most people cannot achieve 
the full potential of their life, right? Uh, it's really hard to live your life to its fullest potential. Uh, Albert Einstein, um, theory of relativity was pretty damn good. On his deathbed, his, le- his uh, last words on his deathbed were, if only I knew more mathematics. So even Albert Einstein didn't feel he had quite accomplished enough. And this is what's called existential gift, guilt, the gap between what you could have achieved and what you ended up achieving in your lifetime. And you can imagine a 45-year-old mother whose children are nine and eight, and she hasn't, and she has uh, metastatic breast cancer, uh, facing a, 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 sh- a short prognosis, uh, the overwhelming sense of existential guilt that she will not have been able to complete the, the, her responsibility of raising her children to the point of being uh, young, independent adults, right? So, And this existential guilt can be experienced as shame. It can be experienced as uh, depression. It can be experienced as anxiety. It can be experienced as uh, anger. Uh, Men tend to get angry. Women tend to get guilty or anxious. Second important uh, sort of uh, 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 unique characteristic of human existence, uh, of an existential concept, is the idea that human beings are meaning-making creatures. Meaning-making is the defining characteristic of human beings as species, and we'll talk about that more because it's sort of the essence of meaning-centered psychotherapy. Third idea is connection or connectedness. We human beings, connectedness is essential to our survival, and that's the essence of the human experience. And it's connection not only to each other and the people in our immediate family and our friends and people we love, people in, in our cities, in our, in, our, in our cultures, in our extended families, in our cities, our countries, the world, the universe. Uh, it's to the past, present, and future. And it's also a connection to something greater than yourself. For religious people, it may be the connection to God. Uh, For non-religious people, it may be a connection to uh, easing suffering, healing suffering, uh, truth, justice, equality, caring, some value greater than yourself, something, some common, some, something that, uh, transcends your own individual uh, experience. It's greater than yourself. Uh, the fourth thing is the, uh, that uh, we're unique in that the capacity for transformation is unique to human beings. We have the ability to choose our attitude towards suffering. And as I mentioned, Carl Jasper described, that defines suffering as any human being's encounter with limitations. And death is the ultimate limitation. But being stuck behind a, a car on a side street, but stuck behind in a car in a taxi on a side street on the Upper East Side behind a sanitation truck that isn't moving when you're when you only have ten minutes to get to um, uh, to to get, deliver grand rounds in some city, that's suffering too, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, they're they're qualitative they're quantitatively probably similar experiences, qualitatively different than dealing with cancer. Uh, but human beings are the only human beings who cho- are the only animals who choose how to respond to suffering and limitation. So we're the only, uh, you know, there's a there's an animal medical center about two blocks uh, down uh, south of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And you, uh, the animals did not create the, uh, the, ma- the medical center. Only human beings create hospitals and cancer centers and things like that. So we have the ability to take, turn a, trage- tra- a tragedy and turn it into a trial. We take uh, suffering and limitations and we choose how to, our perspective towards it, to try to do what we can about suffering. And then finally, human beings seek significance. It seems to be important to us that our lives have been witnessed, that it was at least some sign. Um, And um, for many of us, we're very fortunate. We have uh, family members, we have all sorts of people who witness our lives. A lot of us who are physicians or teachers, we we have patients and colleagues who witness uh, what we do in our lives. Uh, If we teach, as a teacher, you you know, you affect a lot of people, we have a lot of witnesses to your life. 
Uh, but the, the, but uh, ultimately, even if there are very few witnesses to your lives, or every, all the witnesses are gone, they've all passed away, there's always this constant inner witness. There is this, your conscious, um, your conscious self, your conscious thinking self, which comment, uh, 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 your conscious aware self, which is constantly commenting like this morning when i got ready uh i got out of the shower and combing my hair on, and looking at my hair and going oh hey you're hopeless you know that voice that comments on uh, you know this is going well or that's not going well or, i look terrible or, or this is a boring lecture or he, he's talking to all all of that inner voice that that aware conscious self that that co aware conscious self is a constant witness to our lives and that's the that's the entity to which we have to live up to our standards. That's what's that's who's gonna that's that's the entity that's going to judge whether we uh, whether we uh, lived up to our authentic selves, whether we had some kind of impact, whether we learned and taught others how to die and how to live, right? Uh, this is a little bit more detail about uh, uh, human beings. Uh, uh, and the exist uh, of being uniquely aware of existence, uh, and I won't go into that too much. But meaning making is really uh, the essence of uh, meaning centered psychotherapy. It's a divining characteristic of human beings as a species. Frankel proposed that this need to find or create meaning in life is a basic motivating force of human behavior. Uh, he described it uh, similar to uh, Freud's idea of libido or Adler and Nietzsche's idea of the will to power, uh, except he saw the will to meaning as a meta-instinctual drive. Instinct he saw as a, a, a libido he saw as an instinct. And it was, all, it was unique to human beings because of our, uh, our, our very uh, evolved brains, right? We, had, we were able to have drives that motivated our, our lives that were not um, uh, instinct-driven. And uh, he hypothesized that we're driven not only to find meaning in our lives, but uh, because we uh, uh, have to create a human life, a life which by definition is finite and mortal, a life by def which by definition uh, we have to develop attitudes towards both awe and dread, uh, towards uh, limitations and uh, towards awe and uh, we have to develop attitudes towards both living and living in the face of uh, living a human life that is finite and, and which ultimately leads to death. So just as we're driven to find meaning in life, we human beings are driven to find meaning in our deaths. Our fear is that death will negate the meaning of one's life, but death can also be an opportunity to affirm the meaning of our lives. And uh, Frankel also, also taught us that meaning is derived from specific sources. Uh, he talked about connection through love uh, to each other, to something greater than ourselves, our attitude towards suffering, the legacy we uh, inherit, the, the, the legacy we create through the life that we live, and the, and the life and the legacy that we give to others and we leave beyond us, connecting the past, present, and future living and dying authentically. Uh, so meaning can thus exist in both living and dying, and meaning can be derived from very tragic events like the death of a parent or something like that. So a lot of this work, uh, Meaning Sounds Like a Therapy, came from uh, Viktor Frankl's work. And I'd recommend one book, if you're going to read a book, it's called, uh, Frankl's a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, it's very thin. You can read it in a day or two. He actually wrote it in a 48-hour period after he was released from concentration camp. Uh, he uh, was trapped in Vienna, he and his wife and family. He was the only survivor that were in concentration camps. The first part of the book was his, his, uh, um, his description of surviving concentration camp. The second part of the book were all his ideas about meaning and sources of meaning, etc. These are some of the basic concepts. Uh, the, the I'll start with number two. The the first uh, is the the this drive, this will to meaning, the desire to find meaning in human existence. 
uh, is a basic motivating force of human behavior. Uh, the second uh, basic principle, he was a bit dogmatic about it. He felt that meaning always existed. And he was actually open to two, two concepts. Uh, a lot of the modern European, uh, well, post-war European existentialist Camus Sartre, they, uh, they, didn't, they were not religious. They didn't believe that uh, God gave you exter- gave you an external meaning, and it was up to you to to search and find uh, the meaning that God had given you. That in fact, the world was meaningless, life was meaningless, and we had to create our own meaning in order not to go crazy. I guess so. We had to create meaning, uh, and we had to constantly be creating meaning because the half life of the meaning, a meaningful experience, might be a few years max, and then you have to have another meaningful experience. You know, so you're constantly creating and ex- re-experiencing, and, and experiencing and re-experiencing and recreating meaning. Uh, Frankel felt he was open to two possibilities: one that we had to create our own meaning, but two that there was a possibility that there was some externally given meaning. We created MCP, meaning sound psychotherapy, as a secular intervention. Uh, if patients brought in religious stuff, great. We used that. We we didn't we didn't tell them you're wrong, you know. Uh, we we used uh, whatever uh, source of meaning uh, was pertinent to them. Only you can de- only you can determine uh, what's meaningful in your life. I, I can't give meaning sound psychotherapy is not giving somebody what's meaningful in their life. So uh, rather than saying what meaning exists, and, it, and if you feel a sense of loss of meaning, it's only because you become disconnected from it. So you have to go find, find and uh, search and find it. You know, if you've ever lost car keys, and I, I, I know, I know there are no longer car keys in cars, but if you ever lost a set of car keys, uh, it's not like they don't exist. They, they exist somewhere. You have to go kind of find them. But sometimes you never find them, so you have to create new car keys. You know, so. Um, so we really talk about uh, this idea of meaning uh, existing uh, as the as the fact that there is always the possibility, as long as we are sentient and cognitively intact, the possibility of creating or experiencing meaning exists through all phases of life, through becoming, being, and the end stages of life, while living and anticipating death and dying. So you can always create and re-experience meaning utilizing the sources of meaning. And that's why the sources of meaning are central uh, to uh, meaning-centered psychotherapy. That's one of the things we try to do in meaning-centered psychotherapy is teach patients the various sources of meaning to have them become both cognitively and viscerally aware of them so that they can utilize them as resources to help create, recreate, re-experience meaning when they have a sense of loss of meaning. And then finally, the idea of free will, which is kind of controversial, but the idea is that we have the freedom to find meaning in our existence and to choose our attitudes towards life, death, suffering, uncertainty. An uncertain future is the only kind of future in which you have the ability to participate in creating it. So it's a matter of choosing, choosing your perspective, choosing how you respond uh and choosing what and and having the freedom to choose what can, what choice can you make that will approximately bring you back to or help maintain the your authentic self who you are as a person i'm a loving caring person this just knocked me off my trajectory but i still i have cancer i have uh, 6 months to live but i'm still a loving caring person it's, now, these are the sources of meaning. Frankel didn't go into this kind of detail. We elaborated it on a little bit more. Uh, there, there are about four sources of meaning that we talk about in MCP. Uh, I'll start with number two. Experiential sources of meaning are all the ways in which your life is imbued with a sense of meaning through experiencing your life with all of your senses and with all of your emotions. The French word for scent, for love, uh, for uh, um, the, the, fre- the French word for meaning is sens, sense, sensory. So all of your senses, all of your emotions. So experiential sources of meaning, love, relationships, connection, connection to something greater than yourself, awe, 
experiencing everything in you in your as a as long as you're experiencing something as only a human being can experience it that imbues you with a sense of uh, of meaning i am being human so when you're sitting at the edge of the Grand Canyon, you're looking out at the expanse of the Grand Canyon and nature, and you feel a sense of awe, and you feel the particles of your fingers sort of leaving you and, and, and extending into nature and becoming part of eternity and the universe, and you, you're filled with this sense of awe and meet my meaning, etc. The rat sitting next to you doesn't have that exact same experience. All the human beings are able to have this particular kind of experience. Creative sources of meaning are all the ways in which your life is imbued with a sense of meaning through creating your life, creating who you are in the world, engaging in, in, the, in the world through work. What you do should express who you are. And being engaged in the world, connect, and connecting in the world through your work, through deeds, towards causing. And, uh, and uh, life is like... Uh, 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 life is like being in a in a storm, a windstorm. You're being battered by all sorts of external uh, events and internal and from health from a health perspective, internal uh, events that can go wrong. And the big struggle of life is to help is to is to preserve the essence of who you are, preserving your authentic self. Uh, and it helps to uh, and and that's what allows you to sustain a sense of meaning. Attitudinal sources of meaning. The attitudes, the perspective, the values uh, that, that allow you to sustain the choices that you make, that help you sustain uh, your authentic self, uh, the perspective that you take towards suffering, existential problems, uncertainty, limitations, uh, imbues you with a sense of meaning. And then meaning exists in a historical context. We're given a legacy. We don't choose who our parents are going to be, uh, uh, where, what, what time in the, what epoch in the existence of Earth we're born into? Uh, what, what, what country? What, what culture? What language? What socioeconomic? You know, if I had been born in a small village in India, I would probably think that God's a blue elephant. These are all sorts of things that that happen with legacy, right? So we're given uh, our genetics. We're given all these other factors. We're given a sense of values. Uh, uh, we might be born with two parents, no parents, you know, you know, you know, you know etc. Uh, so we're uh, and so it's our job to take what's been given to us, and then to create a life of our own, and to not necessarily be defined, but to be able to create a unique life, a life that's unique to us, uh, to perhaps preserve values that are valuable and we think are good. And and reject values that are, and, you know, I don't want to be uh, an abusive father, things like that. And create a life, a unique life. And that life that you create is the legacy that is what's called a living legacy. It's the legacy that you live. And it's the legacy that you give. And um, this, this legacy, the, the moving from generation to generation to generation, um, uh this is sort of a conduit. Uh, uh, now, the 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 research, the basic genomic researchers at Sloan Kettering Institute will tell you that the uh, that the most important form of life on Earth is DNA, and that the only per the only purpose of human beings is to pass along DNA and make sure DNA still exists in the world. Uh, Meaning, in any sense of psychotherapy, we don't discount genetics, but we also see uh, our lives and legacy that we're given, the legacy we live and the legacy we give as a conduit of generational uh, wisdom, lessons, values, learning and teaching how to live and also how to live a finite life. Uh, there's a Doobie Brothers song called Here to Love You, which I like. It has a line called Passing love along is what we were born to do. Okay. The video is not working and I'm going to skip it. Okay. So what is meaning-centered psychotherapy? Meaning-centered psychotherapy is a brief, structured, manualized, existentially oriented psychotherapeutic intervention uh, designed to help patients suffering with loss of meaning related to cancer. It's designed to help diminish feelings of despair 
by helping patients focus on the importance of meaning and giving them tools to facilitate, recreate, reconnect, and re-experience uh, and sustain meaning in life through utilizing the sources of meaning. It was uh, 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 inspired by the works of uh, Viktor Frankl, and we created two versions, a group and an individual uh, a version. One is seven sessions, one is eight sessions. With MCP, therapists help broaden the range of sources of meaning used by patients through a combination of didactics and experiential exercises. A bit of homework, which is kind of optional, and open-ended discussion, interpretive comments in patients' narrative responses to the experiential exercises. These help patients adopt a, uh, a meaning-focused perspective to help them cope with cancer. The primary goal is to in have patients intentionally and consciously focus on sustaining and creating meaning in their lives. And sustaining and creating meaning in, in uh, life through MCP has been empirically demonstrated to help diminish feelings of despair, hopelessness, depression, anxiety, desire for haste and death, symptom burdens, distress, and increased quality of life. MCP helps patients focus on the importance of meaning and gives them tools to facilitate recreating, reconnecting, and re-experiencing uh, uh, meaning through uh, utilizing the sources of meaning as resources. In MCP, when we're talking about meaning, we're referring to a human being having a sense that their life has meaning. This is both a belief and a cognition. I believe my life has meaning, as well as an experience or emotion. I feel my life has meaning. We experience meaning when we feel fully alive, when we experience both joy, beauty, tragedy, awe, dread, life, as only a human being can. I sometimes describe joy as the emotion of meaning and beauty as the adjective of meaning. Uh, MCP is structured, it's manualized, it's brief. We bring the agenda to each session as opposed to your eclectic kind of psychotherapy that you might do where, you know, what's new today, what's what's been happening. We bring the agenda. We have a task for each session. It's task-oriented more than process-oriented. It's meant to be used as an adjunctive psychotherapy rather than as a replacement for ongoing supportive or collective psychotherapies for patients who have lost sense of loss of meaning, et cetera. The biggest challenge is to present yourself from, pre prevent yourself from pursuing your usual psychotherapy approaches uh, like you know, uh, emotion-focused experience. How did you feel about that thing? Uh, and stick to the tasks of each session and the focus on meaning. It's really okay to when when patients give you the responses, the narrative responses to their questions, to, to ask them, tell me more about that. Because you want to get full details. Because what you're going to try to do with each one of the narrative responses of the experiential exercises in the sessions is to try to uh, explicate a source of meaning or all of or multiple sources of meaning that are contained within that experience that they talk about. Uh, and rather than uh, asking, well, how did that make you feel? Because we're not pulling for uh, a, a emotion. We're, we're trying to uh, we're trying to connect their experiences with meaning and sources of meaning. Uh, we 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 advise we promote using phrases like, "How did that influence or contribute to your sense of meaning?" So this is the individual meaning sense psychotherapy in seven sessions. Uh, uh, we knew we need. Uh, we we kind of sat down in a room and tried to cobble together a uh, an intervention. We knew we wanted it to be brief because we were working with advanced cancer patients. We knew we didn't have like uh, in Spiegel's supportive expressive psychotherapy. We didn't want an eighteen month uh, psychotherapy. Uh, uh, we wanted it to be you know ten sessions, something like that. We knew we needed a first session to introduce the concepts of meaning, the sources of meaning, and, the, and introduce the therapy and have patients introduce each other uh, in group or the patient introduce and the therapist introduce each other, discuss their cancer story a bit. And we knew we needed a, 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 a last session in which we uh, summarized everything and, um, and talked about the next steps, right? Uh, originally, we called the last session termination. Someone pointed out to me, Bill, termination is probably not the best name to give the last session for patients with advanced cancers. So we call it transitions. 
And then we wanted to have a session each on each of the four sources of meaning. Uh, and then we figured we need a connect, needed a connecting session between the introductory session on meaning and, and uh, connecting cancer and meaning. And we did that through an exercise on identity. And these are some of the, the sessions. So uh, each session has a didactic component, which we talk about the basic concepts, uh, you know, the definition of meaning, the basic concepts of uh, meaning, uh, of meaning uh, the sources of meaning. And then this is an experiential exercise. And this is where you as the facilitator um, will ask, uh, will try to explicate and uh, the various sources of meaning contained in the narrative response. So list, uh, for example, uh, list something, uh, um, one or two experiences or moments in life when life felt particularly meaningful, when you felt most alive. And patients will give you one or two or three things. I usually challenge myself. I try to, uh, I try to find all four sources of meaning in every response. I'm, I'm usually about ninety percent successful. Session two talks about is the linking session, talking about cancer and meaning, and we focus on identity. Who, how you would answer the question, "Who am I before I had cancer?" and how you would answer that question after cancer. If you focus on what you do. Uh, and what you're capable of doing, the answers change. But if you focus on who you are, I'm a loving, caring person, I'm a father, I'm a mother, etc., uh, then those process, th those things tend not to not to change. Uh, your identity is composed of all those things that give you your your yourself a, a sense of meaning. Uh, and we does uh, we use what's called this process of moving from ways of doing. To define who you are to ways of being so being a father is is more important than doing a father um you know, throwing a football around things like that the third session focuses on historical sources of meaning and we put this third because it's it's a more of a continuation of getting to know the patient uh so these are a series of questions um that look at uh their their the legacy they've been given the, the legacy, you know, the, the life that they're living, the legacy that they hope to uh, live and give. Uh, the fourth session is attitudinal sources of meaning, encountering life's limitations. And this is the first time and the only time we really uh, overtly talk about death. And uh, one of the questions that, uh, uh, interestingly, uh, patients really are, are are perfectly fine discussing this they uh you know they've established a bit of a sense of trust with you if this question this is this is uh the question is phrased in a sort of a generic hypothetical way you know so it's not saying because you're so sick what it, how well, I'm asking you why so what so what would you consider a good or meaningful death and how can you imagine being remembered etc one of the things that's really interesting is when but when death is all about uh, you, uh, it tends to be less meaningful than when your death is about all of the people you love. When it when when it's an external kind of directed process as opposed to internal, that tends to be uh, kind of death that's meaningful. This is a, a, a an optional homework where we ask patients to do a legacy project and to share that with their family. Sometimes people put together recipes. I had one patient put together uh, folk songs from her culture, and she put on a CD for her uh, or a tape or a digital something for her for, for her uh, grandchildren. Uh, the fifth session focuses on creative sources of meaning, uh, creating your life. Uh, and uh, there are you know, four questions which focused on, um, you know, uh, the fact that it takes courage and commitment to even have the audacity to try to live a life. Uh, and uh, uh, and we also talk about responsibilities, who are you responsible to and for, and also existential good, ult ult unfinished business. The ultimate solution and resolution of existential guilt is self-forgiveness, to be able to forgive yourself. Uh, experiential sources is kind of fun. It's all the ways in which your life's imbued with a sense of meaning through love and beauty and humor. And, and this is a sort of more of a fun kind of session. 
And then the last session is a reflection on all that uh, patients learned uh, and the, the uh, might review their legacy project uh, and an exercise on hopes for the future. It's really interesting. Even though pe patients may lose hope for cure, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of hopes that are still very important that patients have. So uh, MCP in both uh, group and individual format has been demonstrated in four randomized trials to enhance spiritual well-being, meaning and faith, enhance quality of life, decrease hopelessness, desire for death, uh, symptom distress, depression, anxiety, and meaning is the mediating factor in MCP's efficacy. These are some of the uh, RCT trials published in Psycho-Oncology, the Journal of Clinical Oncology, uh, and in Cancer. Uh, the NCI designated MCP as the only research-tested intervention in palliative care. These are the treatment manuals. Uh, there's one in individual and one in mini center cycle and group, and it's basically step-by-step -step how to do it. Uh, we've had a number of adaptations of meaning centered psychotherapy uh, that have been developed by our psychotherapy lab colleagues. Uh, Wendy Lichtenthal uh, adapted MCP for as a grief intervention. She also adapted MCP as an intervention for breast cancer survivors. Allison Applebaum developed adapted meaning centered psychotherapy for caregivers, family caregivers. We have some people working now on uh, health care MCP for healthcare providers. Um, uh, folks in the Netherlands developed uh, MCP for group psychotherapy for general cancer survivors. We have an adaptation for adolescents and young adults. We're developing a brief three-session palliative care version. Joe Winger and Duke developed MCP for coping with cancer pain. And uh, as I mentioned, Billy Rosa and our group is developing MCP for healthcare providers. There have been a whole bunch of replication studies in various countries and about, at this point, 12 or so translations. This is the textbook of meaning sound psychotherapy. It has about 15 chapters with all the various adaptations and about 200 pages of, um, of transcripts of actual sessions, of entire sessions of uh, group MCP, entire sessions of individual MCP. Uh, and we have an R25 training grant, two-day workshops, uh, Take down the email. We have only a, uh, we have one more year left in the in the R twenty five grant. It's our tenth year, uh, and uh, it's a two day workshop with actors playing patients. Uh, this is the new MCP for caregivers treatment manual, Allison Applebaum. Uh, this is the third edition of uh, the Handbook of Psychiatry and Palliative Medicine, which I recommend. It has all of these th meaning everything on MCP, but also so other. Uh, interventions that have been developed in uh, end-of-life care, calm therapy, dignity therapy. Uh, and uh, this is the fourth edition of the textbook of psycho-oncology, which had been, uh, the, all, the prior editions have been, uh, the senior editor was Dr. Holland. I took over after her death, the, the senior editor of this last fourth edition. And this is the Journal of Palliative and Supportive Care that uh, Dan had mentioned. Gray, uh, gray hair of my age, I started taking flying lessons recently. Do you know what my flying instructor told me? If you are starting here, wish to get here, say east, heading for this, and you have a crosswind, you will drift and you will land here, so you have to do what we Pilots call a uh, crabbing, he told me, C-R-A-B, crabbing. You have to head for north of this airfield. If you are heading here above this airfield, then you will actually land here. But if you head for here, you are landing here. Young people were looking for something to find meaning in life. In Mexico, in Guadalajara, 10,000 people. Franco, Franco's wife, people. Ellie. Mother Therese uh, spoke, and, and after Mother Therese, he gave a lecture and, and approximately 10,000 people. If we, if we take man as he really is, we make him worse. But if we overestimate him...
It's premature, your applause, you will soon know why. If we, if we seem to be idealists and are overestimating, overrating man, and looking at him that high, here above, you know what happens? We promote him to what he really can be. So we have to be idealists in a way, because then we wind up as the true, the real realists. And you know who has said this? If we take man as he is, we make him worse. But if we take man as he should be, we make him capable of becoming what he can be. This was not my flight instructor, this was not me, this was Goethe. He said this verbally. Very nice. I, I just wanted to say that uh, that was uh, Victor Frankl. And uh, uh, I showed that last video for three reasons. One is uh, I couldn't, uh, I, you know, I couldn't resist but showing a video clip and giving a lecture, at least where we mentioned Goethe once. The other is uh, when Ellie talked about the order of speakers. She said, first, Mother Teresa spoke. Then Viktor Frankl spoke. So I wanted to imprint in your mind the order of speakers. The first Frankl spoke, first Mother Teresa spoke, then Viktor Frankl spoke, then Bill Breitbart spoke. And then lastly, I showed you the clip to encourage you all to be idealists. Thanks very much. Sorry if I ran over. Thank you. Wonderful. Do we have a moment for any questions? Um, and we're running a little, little behind. There was one. Ah, yes, here it is. Okay. Uh, Bill, what comparison groups have you found acceptable to patients in your trials? Okay, so we've done four randomized control trials. Um, what we usually, uh, so all, all of them have been controlled with active uh, control arms. And so what we what we used typically as uh, control uh, uh, arms was a seven seven week or eight week group uh, structured uh, supportive psychotherapy, uh, and uh, we we actually had developed a manual. Uh, David Kassane, uh and some of his colleagues had developed a, a support a supportive psychotherapy uh, treatment manual uh, in some of their uh, work on bereavement interventions in Australia, and we use that. Um, in, uh, in one trial, in one pilot trial on uh, individual meaning sounded psychotherapy, we actually uh, compared it to massage, uh, mas uh, in integrative medicine massage. But the main uh, three out of the four trials, there was a supportive, uh, uh, an equivalent amount of supportive psychotherapy. And there were treatment adherence and treatment um, uh, um, compliance, uh, you know, uh, uh, ratings. So, you know, we, we checked how many times people in support, uh, didn't use the word meaning, you know, we, we tried to get the support of psychotherapy. The problem in our trials was that uh, support of psychotherapy is actually very helpful. So, uh, one of the things that we learned from a failure of the first dignity psychotherapy trial, dignity uh, therapy trial, is that um, if you did, if patients in your in your in your uh, study did not have, uh, you know, high levels of distress or despair, you would have very, and you had two effective intervention, two relatively effective interventions. You may not have enough room for improvement to show one. Uh, arm being superior to the other. So we began to use thresholds for a uh, distress, uh, you know, a distress score of five or greater on uh, on um, for entry to the, the, the uh, trials so that we be sure we had some uh, variance in the amount of distress. So su supportive psychotherapy. Okay, we have a question from the audience. Just one moment. Yeah. And Dan, if you could repeat the question, because my hearing is not that great. I will. Thank you so much for the presentation. Oh, okay. Um, 
I was, um, I'm wondering, I, I can see how um, creation and experience can be an antidote to the existential anxiety uh, when someone is diagnosed with cancer or battling terminal illness. I'm wondering um, if someone has clinical depression, do you recommend that we treat the depression first and then we implement MCP or we do it with? And just an, the, an, another thing, is there space to use it in substance use as well? Okay. In substance use disorders? Yeah, two good questions. So, uh, yeah, so uh, basically uh, in, our, in our randomized trials, we excluded patients who had um, uh, clinical depression, uh, patients who had uh, cognitive uh, impairment that was sign so significant that they couldn't fill out the uh, rating scales. We had a lot of patients in the group who had brain metastasis. They were relatively concrete, but they could, you know, they were somewhat, con they, they passed our cognitive screen. But yeah, you want to treat a depression before you, uh, uh, you, you get somebody into MCP so that they can they can participate in it uh, fully. Uh, and, I, and I've had multiple inquiries from colleagues in ad addiction, psychiatry, and substance abuse who uh, feel that the, the issue of meaning and sustaining meaning is important uh, in substance abuse treatment. Uh, so f and uh, they've inquired about MCP, and I've shared the manuals with them. I think there is room for some sort of meaning-based intervention in, in addiction. But so far, nobody's really, I don't think anyone that I'm aware of has done it. Someone may, some, someone may have developed some kind of intervention that's related to the, these constructs of meaning, but I do think it has uh, pertinence. I was once on an airplane. Uh, and I was sitting next to uh, a woman who uh, we got we started chatting, and she asked me who I am and what I do, and I asked her what she does. She was a high school principal, and when I talked to her, this was these were in the early days of MCP, and uh, I said, oh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist on Kennery. I've been working on this thing called meaning centered psychotherapy. We talked a little bit about it, and she said she thought it would be a, one of the big problems in, in her high school and a lot of high schools was teenage pregnancy. And she said that one of the problems, one of the reasons a lot of young young adolescent girls get pregnant is because they want to have something meaningful in their life. And she thought that this would be an interesting way of trying to think about preventing. So, so a, lot of, a lot of potential interventions. There were inquiries with other illnesses, obviously. Um, 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 you know, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, mild cognitive impairment, uh, uh, AIDS, uh, all sorts of, uh, uh, yeah, all sorts of other illnesses, uh, loneliness, <laughs> geriatric populations are all feeling lonely. Mm 